Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 28th season, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on today, what they've accomplished, what they're planning for the future. It's a wider net than just writers, however. We have had on sculptors, musicians, actors, all varieties of artists. So if you have an idea for someone who might be good for the writer's block, writer or not, if that person seems like a good candidate, watch for our address at the end of the program. We'd be glad to get your suggestions. I'd also like to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming that comes out of Cape Ann TV is a result of cable access television. It's a wonderful cultural access, access program that serves Cape Ann and the world through our website. So don't be tempted by dish. Don't go near those dish ads. You stick with cable. Tonight, I'm happy to say we do have a writer. Uh, she is a former guest who has returned graciously. Uh, her name is Danuta Borchardt, and she uh, is a uh, principally now a translator, although she has uh, had a varied career in multiple uh, multiple uh, avenues. I will read part of the uh, blurb on the back of her latest book about Danuta. Danuta Borchardt is a Polish-born retired psychiatrist, a freelance writer, and an award-winning literary translator from Polish to English a journey from one language to another. Danuta Borsha, welcome back to the Writer's Block. Well, thank you, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I want to add to this that you were born in Poland, as that suggests, and then migrated to Ireland. Oh, that was much later. My mother and I, we escaped from the Soviets when the, when the Soviets invaded Poland in, uh, in uh, September. We were invaded by the Soviets, and then we escaped first to Stockholm, then to England. Stockholm, Sweden, then yeah, England. Then England, London, and then Ireland. And Ireland was where you went in, to medical school? Yes, in Dublin, yeah. And then you eventually, clearly, came to the United States. And right. when did you move from Ireland to the States? Uh, we came here uh, in 1959, my husband and our first child. And did you practice medicine in Ireland before you came yes, here? I, yes, but I started pr uh, specializing in psychiatry there and in England. In, oh, in England and As Ireland. well, and then uh, I continued uh, uh, training in psychiatry actually here at uh, Boston City Hospital and at Mass General as so, a resident. Did you practice uh, regular medicine here or only as, no, as only a psychiatrist psychiatry. In, in the United States? Yes. You fixed everybody up. <laughs> oh, they fixed me up. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, story, a wonderful uh, and hopeful uh, very story. The, the Soviets invaded in, when, 38? 39, uh, 39 uh, exactly. September. The Germans invaded September 1st and the Soviets invaded September 17th from the east. From the other side. Mm -hmm. The beginning of a huge, unthinkable tragedy. Your book that I want to talk to you about is Life Behind an Author's Works, Memoir of a Translator. I'm going to hold that up so our director, Jim Capilli, can take a picture of that. This came out in early t this year, 2017. This year. Yes. And it is about, well, I, mean, I don't want to blow it, Vitold Gambrovich, Gambrovich, whom you have translated and talked about on the show before. That's right. Uh, is talking about translating his work, but it's much more translating your life. Can you tell us uh, about the book? Um. Well, I w w became very interested in writing a memoir about how the translation process went, which uh, lasted about 20 years. Uh, I was never interested in my own diary or childhood 
memories, anything like that, but particularly about translating uh, Vitor Gombrowicz, because uh, this was uh, quite a, a challenging task. Uh, he was uh, very innovative in the Polish, and I had to uh, concoct uh, English equivalents and so on. So it was a fascinating process. Um, and uh, my former husband, Tom Lane, a uh, native speaker of American English was a tremendous, uh, of tremendous help because I'm not a native speaker. Um, so uh, I had to include uh, in my memoir, and I wanted to include and give him credit for our interactions and his help in this process. And, 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 and it's all in there. <laughs> I like some of the detailed uh, um, facts about the translation, uh, mm -hmm. in, using inversions and when and not to use inversions, yeah. or uh, old forms like uh, forsooth, is that one of the yes. forms you, you talk about? Yeah. Uh, because he used some antique exactly. Polish. So how do you translate that into antique English. Of course, they're not perfect parallels. There's always yeah. some freedom you need there. But yes. it's interesting, the task. Well, uh, I had to uh, read some uh, some of the older books helped me. Some, uh, some of uh, 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 Lawrence Stern a little bit, and Moby Dick, and uh, other older works, so that I can catch the, the uh, rhythm and the words and the, lang the language. Stern is going back to the uh, so, early, so, mid or early 18th century? Uh, it's, uh, it's 1700s, I think, 17, maybe late, yeah. 1520. <laughs> now, um, you, you translated uh, Cosmos and uh, um, Pornographia and uh, Transatlantic, and you all those books are mentioned here, mm -hmm. although I think you're primarily working on Transatlantic. No, no, all four are mentioned. All four. Oh, Ferdudurka oh. was first. And then was uh, Cosmos, Pornographia, and Transatlantic. They're all there. Yes. They're all done. And that these are the, uh, Gombrowicz wrote only four novels. He was a prolific writer in essays and also in some plays, uh, but he uh, only wrote four novels, and that's what I've done. Tell us how you thread in your personal life with you mentioned your first husband Casimir, uh, yeah. whom you moved to England with. Yes. Uh, and here with your son. Yes. But then later you married a gentleman you mentioned earlier named Tom. Tom Lane, yes. Uh, tell us about how that is woven into this. A little more. You, you touched on that, but I was. Yes, well, uh, uh, I, I started to read him a little bit of my translations just to see how, how he would react to it. And uh, he became more and more involved because he liked both Gombrowicz's ideas and his style. He just became enamored of his writing. So he became uh, quite enthusiastic in helping me with the, uh, with the translation. So uh, that was a very interesting... Uh, Does he know any Polish? Not a word. <laughs> <laughs> he, he got it all from my telling him about it. And he, he caught very, very correctly uh, whatever I said, he had some background in uh, in philosophy, so uh, he, any philosophical passages which I have a more problem with, he 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 could explain and uh, express very accurately. I hate that feeling if I'm reading French, for instance. I understand all the words, but I don't understand. <laughs> what they're saying, I don't understand the ideas, because it's so idiomatic or right. so complex right. in some direction, right. philosophical direction. Right. Right. Could I ask you to pick a passage to read for us that would give a sense of the book and its flavor? Uh, Do you have something marked in well, here? Well, I have different, uh, different points. Uh, there's some nice humor when you talk about your marriage to Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, it was on what day of the year? Oh, April 1st, April, 19, Fool. April Fool's Day on 1984. Yes, I like the, uh, the uh, <laughs> intentional, it must have been intentional humor yeah, to pick yeah, the day. Yeah. And then you mentioned it, that fact. I have that marked. I don't know 
if that would be a section you'd like to I read. I don't mind, whatever, yeah. Uh, yeah, April Fool's Day, 1984. 1984, the novel is selling very well this, these days, I understand. Tom and I married on April Fool's Day, 1984, the Orwellian year, you'll notice, no doubt. I seem to have forgotten about Tom's love of sea voyages and freighters, about the fact that my father had also been a man of the sea, and that by returning to Poland he left my mother in tears, but also in anger. When, in her estimation, I was not sufficiently solicitous about his deserting her, Wait till one day Tom leaves you, then you'll understand, she said, reproaching me. Tom? He'll never leave me. Flew through my head. But this exchange happened several years after we were married and would have no play at the beginning of our relationship. Now that's, uh, I, I like that paragraph very much because it's, uh, it's humorous, mm -hmm. and let it's pr and yet it's prefiguring. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, like, yeah exactly. Uh, as soon as you say, he'll never leave me. Oh, think, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, is this book about translating Vitold Gombrowicz, or is it about love? Uh, it's both. Uh, actually, it's both. Because both were in law, in, uh, both happened here during those 20 years. And uh, so uh, one sort of uh, accentuated the other and was mixed in and good and in exciting and sad things happened. <laughs> Both. Both. Did you, did, you, did you start out thinking, I'm going to meld, I'm going to bind this story, my personal story, because it is a memoir, you titled it mm -hmm, a memoir. Mm -hmm with the translation, or did it start out uh, a book only about working with Vitold's text and then became a story about marriage and no. disappointment? Yeah, no, no, I thought, uh, I thought of, of both about the same time because I could n not have uh, uh, translated without well, I could have translated it, but not as well without Tom's help. And he went; he was fairly soon intricately involved in this process uh, f from the first book, actually, through all the f through all the four books. So no, I it was more or less simultaneous. See, it seems to me a very, very nicely done artistic plan. <laughs> uh, although it wasn't planned, it was it was your life. Just so but happened. it seems. It seems almost perfectly uh, uh, balanced uh, to get a, uh, uh, an academic or philosophical idea, the translation of words, yes. uh, and then expand that to uh, individuals trying to understand each other's personalities. Yes, yes. And it seems to me very, very nicely fused. Well, thank you. But I mention here uh, Frank Bedard's poem as the the fate, uh, we, uh, uh, what you love is your fate. So both Gombrowicz's works, not he himself, I never knew him, but Gombrowicz's works and Tom were the two loves, the fate of my two loves. Uh, can you mention Gombrowicz's dates? He was born in 1904 and died in 1969. So he and he stayed in Poland. No, no, no. Oh, he was South America. Excuse yeah, he me. was course, in South America. Course. He's still a legend over there. In Argentina. In Argentina, in Buenos Aires, yes, because he lived there for twenty-three years. One of the uh, sections I. Uh, I noted here because it had to do with your understanding uh, Native American English and also seeing the country. You went to, on a trip to California, and that seems it comes early. Mm -hmm. It seems kind of important. Was that trip itself as important as I imagine it, or oh. or or was that just a, a part of such a, a big? 
panorama that it's, that I'm from California, I was born in California, it's, well, I'm zeroing in on this a little bit. So uh, I was wondering if you could set that out for us. Well, we uh, we traveled a lot uh, to through the mid uh, Southwest and California as well, because Tom was uh, um, he he he, well, he cut semi precious stones. Uh, so we went to various uh, um, grounds for looking for, for for rocks, and so that took us both to to Arizona, to uh, California, and other places, and to various rock shows. And I mentioned this as part of our life together. Uh, when we were at a rock show, and Tom was doing his <coughs> business, I wasn't doing any translating. I was, that was just part of my life. But I felt, uh, at one point, I actually wonder if I'm digressing too much by including that. But I uh -huh. thought, well, why not? You know, that was how it went. It seems it doesn't seem like digression to me. It no, seems, because it seems, it seems uh, fitting. Yeah, well, it did fit. <laughs> uh, I want to go back for just a half a second to another, uh, I guess, a nuts and bolts language question. Mm -hmm. uh, are there expressions in English which, although you've been speaking English for decades and are perfectly mm -hmm. fluent, are there expressions in English, American English especially, that you find strange or odd, interesting? Uh, oh, the, I can't think of any right now, but of course, yes, I do. A any that would be difficult to translate back to Polish? Uh, maybe, for example, to tee off <laughs> is, a, is, is something we don't have in Polish. Tee off on somebody? No, to tee off like in golf. Mm -hmm. uh, because golf is, is played in Poland, but is not as prevalent as it is here. And that, I think that's where the expression comes from. So well, It's a common expression to say, tee off on somebody means to attack someone. or Tee off or, or, or start something. Tee ride. Uh -huh, okay, yeah, no, we don't have that. I, I uh, have to think about it. But I, some, some are easy, some are easy, some are fairly similar. The, the idioms are fairly similar. I find difficulty in, uh, say, translating French to English or English to French with expressions like, you're in for it. Uh -huh. What the hell does that mean? Yes, You're exactly. in for it. Yeah. I, it it yeah. makes no sense. No. But it's so familiar to us that we don't yeah. question it. Right. I have other questions in here. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of your sons, and this is a, a difficult question because it has to do with suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. One of your sons says something quite witty to you, discouraging you from your darker thoughts. Suicide is a very long-term solution to a short-term problem. <laughs> I love that line. I want to remember that line. And I wanted to to compliment you on handling some of these darker moods so well, there is emotion and sentiment without sentimentality, mm -hmm. which is a tough, narrow path mm -hmm. to, uh, to walk down. Uh, you're a psychiatrist as well. Uh, how did you analyze yourself, or did you analyze yourself, and did that help? Uh, not really. I was so... Uh, by the way, I'm not sure if that expression, uh, phrase by Mark, my son, is his original or not. Other people, he may have no, quoted. I'll, I'll, I'll bet not, but well, yeah, I had not seen it before. It, it was so fitting. Yes. He didn't know I had these thoughts. He just somehow sensed that I had these suicidal thoughts. Uh, but um, I was so uh, so distressed. I mainly thought uh, how to get better because I was sort of almost terrified that it's the, my, my sadness stopped me from my working. And I, I thought, how, what do I do to hurry up, to somehow get out of this and hurry up the process of, uh, of translation because I just couldn't, couldn't dilly-dally over it. So I decided to go to a psychiatrist who helped me tremendously. Uh, when he heard how I talked about um, my distress and so on, he said, you're out of control. <laughs> and he said, you need, you need Prozac. 
<laughs> so he gave me uh, another uh, another brand, something else. And uh, over time, it was helped. I mean, I couldn't. Uh, um, f at first, I could hardly maybe two pages through the whole morning. I could. That's all I could do. And then after I got the medication, it, the, the number of pages increased per per morning. You know. And this is this is after you were no longer practicing yourself. Oh no 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 no! This I, I retired in ninety three, nineteen ninety three. So it's long after I started this, uh, long before I started this process, and um, so I wasn't on this medication for about a year, and that was enough. I got over it. And it worked. It worked. <laughs> I thought. Uh, uh, I would guess that's not his own his his line. Um, yeah, probably. But it's a it's wonderful so, line. I hadn't yeah, seen it before. And it's so t it was so timely. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, another example of humor, I think, here, uh, parallel perhaps to getting married on April Fool's Day, mm -hmm. is talking about marriage being on the periphery. And at one point you said, I thought we all, it already was. And I wonder if you could read a little section here and talk about uh, your ideas of marriage now. And uh, Where whether, whether you, uh, 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 well, well, this is a, a, a little bit, uh, Uh, on the periphery, but mm -hmm. Tom was always, uh, always somewhat uh, of a loner, and um, I sensed. And then he moved to Tucson because he couldn't, he couldn't stand the climate here. He came from, he lived in California, almost was raised in California, so he couldn't stand the climate here. And then he got sick and decided, I, I have to move to warmer climates. So he. Uh, so he bought a small, uh, small uh, uh, trailer kind of house in a compound in in Tucson. So, um, so from then on, uh, for, for about uh, ten years, marriage was on the periphery because he was in Tucson, I was here, and it, we were commuting. I went there in the summer. He went here, for, came here for a while, in the winter. Uh, no, no, the reverse. I went there in the winter, and he came here for a few weeks in the summer. So it was already on the periphery. Yeah, it says, uh, he said, now that I may come to, into some money, I want to move our marriage to the periphery. What? Our marriage to the periphery? How much more on the periphery could it be, I wonder? Yes, yes. <laughs> Can you have a marriage at that kind of long distance, 2,000 miles? I think I think uh, people do. We we managed for quite a while, for about ten years that way, and I've I've heard since that the people uh, handle marriages uh, for a long period of time. I I don't recommend that, especially not for young people. <laughs> so uh, no, I, I I picture for younger people, I picture them, them having two families. You know, yeah. I have. You have a family here and a family there, but you're still yeah, married yeah, to this yeah. other person. Yeah, but we were in constant in touch all the time, even though he was uh, so far away, either by telephone or emails. Most of the translation process went through emails. So in fact, I, I quote a lot of emails, his and some of mine. That's that replaces dialogue. That replaces dialogue, dialogue between us. Is it lonely, though, if you're so far away? Well, you know, I missed him. I never feel lonely because uh, I, I don't uh, feel alone, you know, bad, badly about being alone. You know, I don't feel lonely, but I missed him, of course. I thought that was very interesting to me, and I wondered if there was a parallel between uh, you were um, you're coming to the end of your translation work mm -hmm. and... At the same time, you're coming to the end of the marriage. Marriage, yes. Which is very, very kind of sad yeah, and yeah. For, for you and for the reader. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, was the translation keeping you together? 
I think the translation was a big part of keeping us together because uh, he he enjoyed the intellectual side of our relation relationship in this more than many other things. I mean, he was loving and you know attentive and so on, but he really enjoyed the uh, intellectual <laughs> exchange <laughs> about about Gombrowicz. It's interesting. He's a geologist. I wonder if yes, there's a parallel there. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Um, we're getting close to the end of my uh, half hour, and I wanted to ask you, because memoirs are so popular now, and many many people try to write them, uh, very few as successful as you are. Do you have any advice to people who are maybe watching and thinking, well, I've been through some interesting processes and some adventures in my life. What would the rules be to someone like that? Well, uh, one of the problems is the, the first thing any agent or publishing house will ask you, who will, your readers, who will be your readers? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a sort of general statement that for me particularly is, uh, is a bit of a problem because who will be the readers of something as specific as Witold Gombrowicz, whom people have hardly ever heard of? and uh, translation and so on. So um, uh, I think the main thing is to, uh, uh, to find a good agent. That's the thing these days now, to find a good agent who will, uh, who will uh, uh, help you. But, um, so you were able to find an agent? No, no, no. I finally gave up. Oh, you gave up? I thought, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought you had an agent because of the earlier translation. No, no, not, uh, Yale, Yale University Press that published uh, 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 those, some of the books uh, do not do memoirs. Grove, the other publisher, it wasn't a good thing for them at the time. So in fact, those great publishers, I couldn't, I couldn't have them. So the only thing I can uh, think of now is uh, is get in touch with the Slavic departments of the U.S. universities where they teach Gombrowicz, and uh, because that's where they use my translations, my translations in our standard book, standard book, standard books for teaching Gombrowicz in his works. Mm. So uh, I think in uh, in the students and so on would be uh, would be interested. So that. But I don't know. It's hard to advise how to publish. <laughs> so find find your audience and if find you your audience. Think about a big audience yeah, yeah. if you can. But you know, to be a little bit vain, I, I sort of like like what I've written, <laughs> and I wanted it out. I wanted it read. Yes. So I decided to go through Amazon.com, and uh, and uh, that's what happened. Are you happy with it? Yeah. Yeah, and the Amazon.com put, if you uh, Google my name on Amazon.com, it comes out with the other translation, with uh, the translations at the same time. So it's sort of. Let me hold the book together. up one more time. We are out of time. Uh, uh, this is Danuta Borchardt's new book, Life Behind an Author's Works Memoir of a Translator. If you've learned something about translating the famous Polish author Witold Gombrowicz uh, and Danuta de Borchardt's pursuit of translating uh, him for American audiences, then the writer's block has done its job. Thanks for being with us, and I hope to, be, hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Thank you.